Good afternoon and welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary. I am uh, Dr. John Nordling, a professor of exegetical theology, and it's my great privilege to lead you with a study of the epistle for proper 10 series B, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Uh, but before I get to that, let's go to the prayer. Uh, the collect of the day. I always like to begin with that, so let us pray. O Lord, you granted your prophets strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance. Give us pure hearts and minds to follow your Son faithfully, even into suffering and death, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, uh, a glorious uh, collect um, that unfortunately is really not tied in any direct way that I can see to the epistle lesson, except for one thing that occurred to me. The uh, gospel lesson for this Sunday is from Mark chapter 6, 14 to 29, and that's the very fulsome account of the death of John the Baptist, okay? And uh, it's recorded in all of the synoptics, but Mark, uh, for whatever reason, gives the fullest expression of it. And it really, I think, depicts it as a martyrdom. And so uh, that's how the, uh, the collect definitely works. You granted your prophet strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance, i.e. just as John does. And then we pray for pure hearts and minds to follow your son faithfully, even into suffering and death, just as John did. Okay, so that's kind of the theme. Now, possibly the epistle lesson then, which is, um, and you can turn it there, John, to the, yeah, I see you got it up. Um, this very, very long sentence in Ephesians um, uh, is is meant kind of as a glorious uh, commentary on on the uh, on the gospel lesson. Um, <laughs> once again, um, I feel like this is really difficult Greek. If it's hard for me, then it's going to be hard for you pastors. I've I've read a lot of Greek, a lot of the New Testament, and this is just a tough passage. It's long. And it's even hard to, uh, to work it. And I, I learned uh, from reading Winger's commentary uh, all this morning that it's uh, one long sentence in Greek. It never comes up for air. There's all these relative pronouns. That, and so it just keeps on going and going and going. And there are difficult constructions galore. So we will do our best once we get into the, into the letter uh, in, into this lection. So let's, let's just uh, begin then uh, with the lesson. Eulogitas hathaos kai pater tu kiriu hemon yezu. So blessed be, um, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, having blessed us with every spiritual blessing, so he's definitely playing on, you know, eulogitas, the adjective, uh, eulogesas, the, the, the uh, aorist active participle, and then with every spiritual blessing among the heavenlies in Christ. That's how it begins. Now, Winger has a good insight, I think. Um, he says that this entire section is a barakah, I hope I spelled it on oh, this pen, a baraka, which uh, is, is a kind of a, a Hebrew Jewish prayer that you have lots of examples from the uh, Old Testament of. And that's how this is pitched. I mean, it's, it, it proceeds in this way. And then it has very grand, eloquent diction, very liturgical phrases. And maybe that's my difficulty with it is, and just the difficulty with 
uh, the text is it's so liturgical and it takes us, I think, perhaps to into the, the cultus and ritual and prayer of the, of the early Christian communion. And that's what Winger really says in his commentary that I've been reading. Um, uh, so it begins that way. Now, if you look at the text again, you'll see that I attempted to divide it into kind of subgroups. And that's what Winger does in his, in his commentary and his translation. And he tries to divide it from verses 4 and through 6, uh, Father, he has it, and then from uh, verses 7 through uh, uh, 12 into a son section, and then from verses 13 through 14 as a Holy Spirit section. I'm not quite sure, having fought through this Greek several times now, if that really does fit, but it might. Okay, so for example, as this goes on, uh, kathos exeloxato hemos en auto. So just as he chose us in him. Well, who's the subject of the exeloxato? Of course, it is um, a God the Father, we would say. And this in auto would be Christ the Son, okay? Uh, before the foundation of the world, that we be holy, hemas hagios kai amomas, and blameless before him. Now, I think that auto is talking either about God the Father or Christ the Son. It, it's somewhat indefinite here uh, with love. Um, so maybe the Father's love, okay? Um, having uh, set us apart, pro oridzas hemas eis huiothesion dia Jesu Christu eis auton. So having set us apart for sonship through Jesus Christ for him. And again, that auton uh, is probably referring to God the Father, I would say. But you can see that whenever it's not just talking about about God the Father and just about God the Son, but both the Father and the Son are, are together. Um, they're, they're pictured uh, in this way together, very much so. Um, so, um, what can we say about this? Um, Winger says, suggests that we could look at this baptismally, that a lot of the language makes sense with baptism in mind, and some of the very uh, language that he, he uses uh, seems to lend itself in this way, and I'll point this out as we go through. Another uh, thing that we could point out here as you're attempting to preach this, I'm assuming that's what you're trying to do with this text, is um, another, another theme that is revealed here is what we would call predestination. Not double predestination, that's what Calvin says in, in Reformed Evangelical Christianity, but predestination, that in Christ God destined us, he predestined us, and it's more than just his foreknowledge, but his actual doing in eternity. Okay, so you see that idea here in verse 5, and, and see the pro, pro oridzos. Okay, so it happened before, destined us beforehand, unto sonship, okay, huiothesia. Now that's, uh, of course, another um, uh, theme that Paul takes up and develops much more greatly in Romans and especially in Galatians 3 and Galatians 4, where he really says more about this. But um, sonship, and he even says, through Jesus Christ unto him or toward him. So. Christ is our brother, in other words, and God is our father. We have the Lord's Prayer. But um, uh, in Galatians, the language of slavery is used, and we become, instead of slaves, we become uh, God's sons, okay? And uh, we take the place of a, of a son theologically, whether we're men or women, we're sons in, in, that, in that role through Jesus Christ toward him. Um, and then it goes on, according to the good pleasure of his will. 
okay? I'm not sure what to make of that. <laughs> but it's grand, eloquent language. Um, something else that occurred to me while I was working through this, and, and Winger doesn't really go there. He talks about the Jewish background of the letter and the great temple of, of Artemis um, that was in uh, Ephesus and polytheism and so forth. But also, um, Ephesus was, of course, the, the main Roman point of entry for the very rich um, province of Asia, and we call it Asia Minor, and Ephesus was the place, and let's not forget that Paul was there according to the accounts given in Acts um, at least two and a half years, and in some places it says he was there three years. So he spent a lot of time there um, lecturing in the lecture hall of Tyrannus and and other places. So Paul invested a lot of his time there, and so like any other city in um, the Mediterranean basis of this time, Ephesus would have been a thoroughly Romanized city. And if it was, then um, it's not too great of a stretch to think that maybe Paul takes over a liturgy, an imperial liturgy for Lord Caesar, and he uses it now for Lord Christ, although Kyrios is really not used in this section. But nevertheless, Jesus is Lord and, and, uh, and God the Father. So this first chunk being uh, devoted to him. All right, let's keep going here in verse 6. Um, and I've got, uh, <laughs> I've got Winger here in case I get stuck with the Greek. Uh, verse 6, for the praise of the glory of his grace, which he graced us with uh, in the beloved. That's what, that's what it says. So very highfalutin, uh, high, highly liturgical language. Um, for the praise of the glory of his grace. Whose grace? Is that the Father's grace or the Son's grace? Take your pick. It could go either way which he graced us with. Heis ekaritosen hemas, um, in the beloved. Now this uh, ekaritao, karitao, um, that could be one of the phrases used for the abundance of blessings that we have in baptism. I think it could go that way. And then especially with how this um, ends, the editor here uh, does provide a period. Thank goodness you really need it. Uh, in the beloved, and remember when Jesus was baptized at his baptism, he said, um, this is my son with whom I am well pleased, okay, and he calls him the beloved. Uh, not in exactly the same way, I admit, but uh, similarly. Okay, John, if you could scroll up so I can get to the next verses. Okay, yes, we'll take the next section. Um, in whom, so in ho, uh, probably this is referring to Christ, we have the redemption, the apolutrosin, which is a really important word and it occurs twice in this text, through his blood, of course, that would be through Christ's blood. Uh, and then by apposition, he adds tain opposin ton parapetomaton, uh, the forgiveness of our, not sins, but our transgressions, okay? Uh, in accordance with the wealth, the ta plutos of his grace. Whose grace? Um, is it the Father's grace or the Son's grace? Uh, again, uh, like I said uh, earlier, uh, this may mark kind of the Son, the son part of the, of the lection. Uh, maybe this pen won't work, no big deal, okay, um, of his grace, which he lavished upon us, eparisusen ace hemos. Again, it makes one think of baptism. It's not exactly connected to water or to baptisma or baptizo, I admit, but Winger uh, uh, has shown this, I think, in his commentary to my satisfaction. Um, in all wisdom and thinking, in passe sophia kai phronese, 
Uh, Sophia is a big idea that you have in 1 Corinthians 1 to 3, the wisdom, and then the phronesis, uh, the thinking, is an idea that you have in Philippians, uh, very much that I've been working with. But again, he drops these phrases and then really doesn't do anything with them here in this section. So it's kind of hard to see how they hang here. Um, my, my thought is it's meant to elevate the language. So, um, having made known to us, verse 9, the mystery of his will. Now, this auto I take to be the Father's will. That would make sense. Um, having made known to us the mystery, the, and we have uh, this mentioned also in Ephesians, uh, the mystery that was hidden for, for many ages and has been made known now in Christ. Um, Paul develops that idea elsewhere in Ephesians. And this would be good to just check a good commentary, or not commentary, but concordance against mystery and see how mystery is used. Again, uh, uh, homiletically, you need a hook. Uh, no sermon ever works without some type of a, of a seed. And this may be a way in for you if you just do a good work on the word mystery, how Paul uses it, uh, not only in this text, but throughout the book of of Ephesians. It probably occurs, I'm guessing, three or four times. Check it out in uh, Moulton and Gideon. Okay, uh, now where am I? Um, uh, yeah, the mystery of his will, verse 9, in accordance with his good pleasure which uh, he set forth in him. And you've got this pro -etheto. Okay, which again makes us think of the predestination language. Uh, in him, this would again be, I'm assuming, Christ, um, although the nomenclature can go both ways. Um, now it starts getting kind of tough, and I might have to cheat a little bit here in verse 10. Uh, you, you have to take some liberties with the Greek, uh, no matter how literal you're going to try to be. Uh, Winger says to administer the, fu the fulfilling of the opportune moments, okay? So you have this, uh, this oikonomian, the stewardship of the fullness of times. And this might, again, take you right back here to the, the, to the mystery talk, that at just the right time, um, God revealed the mystery of salvation in his son, Jesus Christ. I think that works quite well there. Um, uh, the fullness of, of the times, uh, that makes me think, of course, of Galatians 4, 4, that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, uh, born under the law, born of, of a virgin, okay? And I think it has the similar meaning right here. That's in Galatians 4.4, 4, and Pleroma is kind of used similarly here and at the end of this lection. Um, two, um, anakephali osastai. How many syllables is that? One, two, about seven syllable word here. Anakephali osastai, to sum up, to bring to a head all things in Christ, okay? Ta epitoi uranois, kai ta epites geis en auto. So the things that are in the heavenlies are in the heavens, and the things on earth in him. I'm taking that to mean in Christ. In whom indeed, I think you're going to have to scroll up again, John. In whom, um, verse 11, uh, yeah, he has... Um, in whom we have been appointed, uh, we, we have been uh, elected, Rothamen, to be pre-arranged. Uh, so again, we got, oh, that doesn't work. Okay, there's something wrong with this pen here. Um, there we go. So you've got this pro oristhentes in accordance with the purpose. And now, now you have this very huge expression, to 
is going to go with Energuntas of him who was working all things in accordance with the will of his will. Okay, that's what the Greek says. Uh, he's using synonyms here, and it's just hard to get this eloquently into, into English. So that we be, for the praise of his glory, we who have hoped uh, in, ad, in advanced, we who had hoped in advanced in Christ. And Winger thinks that that hoping in advance has to do with um, the, the Jewish uh, Christians, those who were originally taken from Judaism into the church uh, in Christ. Okay, we got to keep moving. I, I knew this would happen, that I'd run out of time. Okay, so this last part, this may be the Holy Spirit, in whom also you, akusantas tan logontes aletheos, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, by which, uh, and I think this ho goes back to the gospel here, um, or it could be the word, uh, also having trusted, were sealed. Okay, so esphrogistheta, and that's an, again another baptismal word, uh, by the spirit of, of, well, look at how this goes. You have to noimati to hagio, right? That's how it goes. By the Holy Spirit of, of the promise, which is the arabone, the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of, of, uh, of, his, of his personal possession to the glory of, to the praise of his glory. <laughs> what do you do with this? <laughs> I'm not sure. It's a great glorious text to Christ. It has lots and lots of lumber in it that uh, you could preach 10 sermons on this. I would pick something out like mystery or redemption, use a good commentary, and follow the language through. Don't go, don't follow it into the gospel. Use, use as your uh, area to work the, the epistle itself. See how Paul uses the language in Ephesians and unpack it for there, applying it also, always to your people and to your situation. That would be the way to handle this text, and I think you'll have a lot of fun if you do. God bless you. Thank you.